I have, <laughs> I'm sorry, lost my cord again. I have Dr. Ruash here, um, Bagat. He's our educational chief. He's the one that's waving at us. Hello, everyone. Um, and we have, I have another, probably three other residents invited. A couple of them are in our hospital for stroke call, and there's one on night float that really wanted to join in. So I think they'll just pop in whenever. Whenever they hear. So, Dr. Uh, Turin. Dr. Turin's here. Dr. Turin is here. Dr. Pilati. I think we lost her. Yeah. Did you lose me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, you are breaking. Uh, okay. Well, I can move, it, move in another room. That might be better. I'm sorry. I thought the connection was going to be good here, but... Okay. I will transfer myself upstairs and... on a video and just... Okay. This is probably better, right? Yes, much better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, does anybody want to introduce themselves? Hi, Valine. I've seen you before. <laughs> I think does. Oh, yeah. I remember seeing Dr. Amdapuri, right? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Dr. Palari. How are you? Good, good. How are you? How was your weekend? I'm fine. Very good. Wait. Enjoying the weather and the leaves and everything. It's amazing. Hi, hello everyone. My name is Rolando. I think this is my first time. Uh, hello everyone. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Hi everybody. Hi Dr. Pallade. This is my first time as well. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you too. Hi, Dr. Vlade. Hi again. Nice to see you again. Nice to see all you. of you. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Vlade. I'm Parul Pehel. This is my first time attending this session as well. Very nice. Thank to you meet for you. coming. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is Eduardo. My first time here too. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you, Eduardo. Okay. Hello. Well, okay. this is who you are. I think we'll have more. Um, people joining us in. So um, I'll start with a little brief you know, introduction of myself. Dominique, who's here in the background, actually she's on, the, on our background there, the whole departmental picture. She's been with our residents for approximately 10 years, but she's been at UOL for much longer. I have been director of the program for a little over five years now. Tonight. We have four positions per year, and we're filled now uh, in all positions. So we have currently 16 residents in our program. 
And uh, for PGY2 level, we have the pediatric neurology residents joining us. This year we have um, two residents. Next year, next PGY2 year, which starts July 2021, we'll have three of them. So they've increased their complement and their third year of PIS Neuro is spent in adult neurology for the entire time. So we typically manage about 18, 19 residents at a time. Um, I'll take any questions because I know the hour is not very long. If anybody has specific questions, um, you found us on social media, obviously. We do post a lot of um, ongoing activities, symposiums that we have, the stroke symposium, the epilepsy and headache symposiums. Uh, Dominic puts a link to all grand rounds that occur um, every Thursday. So right after the completed, you'll see links where you can um, hear, see some of the faculty and our um, invitees for grand rounds. Um, I think we have, Dominic, you put last time even the blog schedule on online, right? For, the, for anybody that has specific questions. And, but I'll be happy to answer anything that you'd like to know. Hi, Dr. Brade. Again, I have a question. Are yes. you guys able to hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, as every one of us are closing up their applications and everything, I just wanted to know the insight of the program about the personal statement. When the program director or the selection committee reads the personal statement, what they like to be in the personal statement? Would it about ourselves, the accomplishments, things we have done in our life? like? what the selection committee thinks of a personal statement what should it be in your opinion that's my question thank you well personal statement is really something that expresses yourself everybody can take a different approach to that um i enjoy seeing the personal side of you not just the physician side of you i think the personal side of you is really what makes you um you know human and makes you interact with the environment and makes you down the road successful so anything that you think it's personal to you, you want to emphasize, and it could be just, just medicine, but it, there's typically a lot more than just medicine to one person. So I would open up, be honest, and, you know, challenge us. Let us read and enjoy it. Do you. you want to say something? We cannot hear you, Rewaj. Oh, really? Sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, as Dr. Pallade said, yeah, personal statement is a very crucial part of the application. Uh, apart from the CV, it will kind of, it's a kind of a mirror to show yourself, especially your personality, uh, your pathway, and your inclination towards the neurology. Um, so uh, be honest. Uh, that's what I did in my personal uh, statement. Um, try to be very concise. Um, and uh, hitting the bullet point um, and uh, um, make it simple as well. That, that's what I did. Yeah, and I would just add on the thing that uh, the fact that it says personal statement is the fact like it's personal and it, it, it has not to be what others tell you or what we have heard from others. It's a personal story and believe me, it's different for everyone. That's what makes it unique. Uh, this is Dr. Um, Tamor Tareen. Uh He's one of our PGY4 residents as well, on rotation at Jewish Hospital. I can't really see him. He's probably on somewhere. He's just not on my screen. But thank you for jumping in. <laughs> I've been here since beginning, Dr. Pilate. You're with. I cannot have you. I I'm sorry. I just don't see you. Oh, I see your I see uh, your. TT over there. I, do, I couldn't see your face. I was looking for your face, I think. So um, maybe I can go through some of the questions that a few of the candidates have expressed before this, and I can just take them uh, one by one. Uh, the first question is, are there any specific requirements for IMGs? Uh, we don't have any specific requirements. Obviously, um, we want the application to be complete with um, letters of recommendation, the scores, at times, the ECFMG certification does come later, 
but it would have to be available before the uh, end of the interview time, before rank list is, you know, due. Um, we don't necessarily have a hard cutoff for scores uh, or for number of letter recommendations. I think you would want to choose somebody that can speak about yourself, who you are as a, um, you know, person, as a physician, as a neurologist, or you know, aspirational neurologist. Um, let me see. Um, Personal statement, like I said, it's important for a lot of faculty to get to know who you are. Go ahead, somebody has something. Um, so I'm Parul. I just asked a question, uh, wanted to ask about because of COVID, like there were limited opportunities for doing any, you know, research or any sh shadowing opportunity, specifically in neurology. So will anything uh, done, like if you've done anything in internal medicine or some other specialty, will that be uh, looked upon as a negative or, you know, how do you see that? I don't think that's being looked at as negative. I think anything that gets you used to the American system would be beneficial. Um, you know, the, the program consists of a whole year of internal medicine. So I don't see how a medicine rotation or, a, you know, observership would really uh, ruin the application in any way. I think it shows continuity, the desire to be involved. Um, no, I mean, I don't think we've never held it against anybody. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, so th my name is Omar. This is my first time to attend uh, uh, your open house. So uh, I just want to hear more from the res Maybe this question came before, but I just want to hear from the resident, Dr. Yes. Bagat and Dr. Tareen, about what sets this program apart from other uh, neurology programs. Uh, I know that uh, Dr. Faradi, you, you, you might. <laughs> I will let them talk. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, I would like your insight too, of course. Okay, Thank sure. You. I'm happy to take that question. Um, uh, like uh, being in the fourth year right now, and I've uh, interviewed uh, a couple of programs for my fellowship. So I came across the different programs and how they are structured. So, um, so I do have a little bit of insight, like how this program is different from the other programs, especially. Uh, it's a very small program, like four residents per year, and the active residents will be altogether 12 residents, and two, and next year, three more of the child neurology resident. So it's like a family. Uh, it's like a family. Everyone are uh, well known to each other. The faculty members are really approachable. Um, they are like a family as well. And uh, the environment matters a lot uh, during the residency. Um, uh, it, it is always what you make out of residency rather than you being spoon-fed uh, uh, to the teaching. So it gives you an opportunity with this friendly environment uh, to interact uh, with your uh, mentors. If you have any kind of a, a research project, you can uh, go and talk about it. Uh, they are very open and approachable. Rounds are very flexible um, and very high yield. And uh, that's how we learn during residency. And um, also uh, being in the very friendly environment, um, I think uh, the issue of the burnout also doesn't feel much. So you feel like a second home in your program, and uh, that's what uh, it really matters. It's a four year of journey, and it matters a lot. Yeah, that's nice. Thank you so much. I would, I would second that, uh, just uh, reinforcing the fact that he mentioned, I mean, uh, what sets us apart, I mean, with the attitude, you go into residency program anyway, and I'm sure if you have the attitude, you will learn, but it depends on how how you spend those four years and during that course, like, do you want to get that feeling, I want to get done with this as soon as possible, or now I'm liking it, it's it's more like of a home for us. So, I mean, it's, it's understandable, residency has ups and downs, but uh, I have a family, I have kids, and I, I can tell you countless times when I've needed my residents, I've counted on them, I've called them in the middle of night, they've provided me back up, everyone from second year to fourth year. I feel very comfortable with the attendings, like just Bhagat mentioned, I mean, uh, nobody knows more than anyone, especially in neurology, there's a lot of difference of opinions, and I don't think there's a right or wrong in what we do, it's just at how we look at things, and 
the art of it is that our attendings are very approachable. I mean, if I have a question with neuromuscular attendings, I feel free to text them. I was reluctant initially in second year, but as you grow up, you see how welcoming they are. They'll be glad to teach, glad to text you back, call you back. Uh, if with autoimmune, epilepsy, anything, I'm, I can, they're just call away. And I mean, they don't mind me calling them on weekend, on weekday, in the morning, evening. I mean, that's a big thing. I, I really believe that. Uh, they're very easy, approachable, they're always helping, guiding us, let it be patient-wise, book-wise, anything. I mean, you feel it once you come here, honestly. It has been a blessing, at least in my residency. I've never had any doubt about approaching and attending. Amazing. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to go for some of the other questions that I had here. So um, interviews will all be virtual, obviously. Um, this is not the safest time to travel, although we would love to be able to meet everyone face to face, including our residents. I mean, it's nice to turn the corner and see one of them just because we haven't had the chance to see each other in such a long time. But um, somebody asked about upcoming changes in the program. Um, I don't think we're foreseeing a lot of changes. What I'd like to see is a few more residents, and I'm hoping that you know a year or two down the road we're going to be able to go to five, maybe six residents. Uh, we switched. Uh, four years ago from regular um, call schedule to a night flow system. So we have now a um, night flow system for all years. Um, they're spread depending on the year. And um, um, we have um, six nights of inpatient call, essentially every night call. During PGY2s and 3s, all calls are um, in, in the hospital. PGY4 calls, um, a Jewish, and most of them are a Jewish, are from home. Uh, night flow starts Sunday night at 7 p.m. They're 12 hour calls, so 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Sunday, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The uh, residents chose about a year ago to stay in around another four hours on Saturday. Um, so 11 a.m. on Saturday, they go home. That way somebody else can stay home and enjoy the day off. Um, PGY2s now have nine weeks of night float, so it's six, six times nine, really, it's 54. Four of them are at the university hospital, and five of them are at Jewish. PGY3s have seven, and PGY4s have 5.5. And again, they split that one half at university and four at Jewish. Um, the, uh, there's ongoing discussion now whether or not the Saturday is going to remain a 24-hour call or it's going to be split between 12, and it's up to them to meet and discuss and decide in the end. Um, we felt that the night flow system has really helped with fatigue. Um, we're moving toward assigning residents to have the night flow during the service months when that um, can happen, and that's to free up some of the time in electives. Um, it doesn't always work out, but it can. we can try to make it work out as much as we can. Also, when there are two or three of them on the rotation, they'll take turns and cover all at the specific rotation, while the other two or the other one will cover the daytime. The nighttime will be assigned to one of the residents. That way, when they have time on electives, they can take vacation and do um, elective, um, whatever they chose to. Um, Faculty, we had two new faculty that joined us in um, July. Dr. Hedera, who's a um, um, movement disorder specialist that came from Vanderbilt, and he is well advanced in his career, so he's a senior faculty. And um, Dr. Fang, who was U of L um, student, completed her residency and fellowship training at Cleveland and joined us. Um, so she started in August, and she's a neuroimmunology and multiple sclerosis specialist and working in EMS clinic. We're um, looking to have another epilepsy faculty added, and we have offers out for one faculty we're hoping is going to join us, and she'll be really very good. Um, we're trying to um, hire additional hospitalists from, um, for Jewish hospital. And I think it will happen at least one or two in the next year or so for um, Jewish Hospital. Um, next year, like I said, there will be three PGY, two pediatric neurology residents that will be uh, joining us. 
which means that the number of calls will be a little smaller compared to this year. Um, and I don't think we have anything else planned unless we go up on complement. They're not particular particular major changes we're gonna we're gonna make. Oh, there is one stroke faculty that's being uh, I believe has been offered a job for um, November or December to start. So I see two potentially new faculty by June starting and two maybe in the summer in addition to the two that just join us. We're moving the epilepsy monitoring unit from one hospital to another, but it's not necessarily a, um, I don't know, improvement is just a change of location. We're hoping to upgrade the number of beds maybe by one, but for me it's major, but I don't think it would impact the residency in any way. Let's see what other questions? I have a question. Uh... Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Now that you were um, you were talking about stroke and uh, how do you think the faculty is going to increase in the next years, um, I was asking uh, specifically about uh, once a resident finishes a training at your hospital. Yes. I know this is very difficult to know from from now, but on average, what are the probabilities for that resident? to start working with you at the hospital as a faculty to teach and everything else. Thank you. Well, um, we have um, we have Dr. Schaefer, who is one of the epilepsy attending that was our resident, did a fellowship and stayed with us. Um, and Dominic can help add to this list. Dr. Brown, he's one of the neuromuscular um, um, faculty that did residency here, I believe did fellowship and then joined us. Dr. Sag is one of the other epilepsy uh, faculty that started about three years ago. He was resident, went to Vanderbilt to do a fellowship and came back. Um, Dr. Chapman, who's not here anymore, but was a student here, went to UNC to do her um, residency and came back when it was faculty for about five years. Um, Dr. Feng, I believe, did her medical school here, went on to Cleveland and came back and she's faculty here. Let me see who else I missed. Dr. Hernandez has been our resident fellow and has been with us ever since, I don't know, maybe 10 years. Dominic, what do you think? Yes, he graduated in 2008. Okay, so 12 years. Oh, 12. Um, who else? Dr. Habubi has been our resident, right? Mm -hmm. And the neuro hospitalist for about three years, did a stroke fellowship, and now is faculty for about a year or two. Um, Dr. Shah was here after residency. He said yes, yes, Dr. Shah. Dr. Shah was our resident, went to NIH, did a fellowship, came back, and was here five, six years. He came one year before me and just left in April for uh, private practice. Thank you. Some more. Um, uh, so I think what we counted eight, maybe almost ten. So out of our current faculty, we have 31 current faculty, um, and that includes child neurology as well. Out of the 31, 12 of them have either um, did med school or med school and residency here. So 12 out of our 31 faculty had some kind of um, connection to the University of Louisville. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I have one question. Yes. Can you tell me about the outpatient clinic experience and how it is laid out, please? Yeah, um, outpatient clinic increases as you go through the training. Um, there are three months of elective in um, PGY2. There are, um, I believe, five months, four or five months in PGY3, and there are about six months in PGY4. So overall, it's close to probably 12, close to 12 months of elective in, in the, you know, three, four years of residency that can be spent in um, outpatient neurology. PGY1 has four months of electives, and we met last week, and there was a suggestion from some of our residents that we potentially could use some of those months as additional elective time for them. 
So we, we might add another month or so during PGY1. So okay. um, if the number of residents increases and the complement increases, there'll be obviously an increased number of um, elective months that we offer just because there are more residents to split the service months. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Um, so now that you mentioned all the interview will be held virtually, I would like to to know how it's gonna be a typical day of interview. We're hoping to start the day around 7:30 to 8 um, interview day. Uh, We'll have about 30 to 45 minutes presentation about a program. We have a uh, PowerPoint. I'd like to share some of our information with the candidates. And then there'll be um, five individual faculty. Um, you'll meet until 12 with probably somewhere of 20, 25 minutes break uh, in between. And 12 to 1, we have a case conference that we're hoping everybody can attend and um, follow the interaction and the cases that present are presented. The prior night, you'll have the, you know, kind of virtual meeting with residents as well. Um, it takes place of the prior dinner we used to take the candidates out with, but since that's not, you know, available anymore, we'd like the candidates to be able to meet the residents alone without anybody <laughs> and ask all the questions they can, they feel, you know, need answered from them. So. Thank you. So there was a question about the year after graduation, and I'm not sure I understand. Uh, Dr. Wei? Can you guys hear me? Um, there was a question on the chat about the, the year after graduation. Can yeah, you be more specific? My, yes, because I did my PhD uh, in neuroscience, so that my year after graduation is definitely more than five years old. But I remember when I was reading the web page of your program, there is a requirement of less than five years. So I just wanted to know. I think that's an older requirement. We've had uh, residents that graduated many, uh, many years in advance, you know, definitely longer than five years. Um, and we don't really hold uh, the cutoff at five years. Uh, we haven't for the past five years that I've been the program director. We look at the candidate as a whole. We don't have a cutoff for, you know, years before graduation or exposure or number of serverships. We look at the candidate as a whole, includes test, um, test scores, um, year of graduation, exposure, experience, what they bring to the program, who they are as a person. So it's a well-rounded candidate that we're looking for. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that does. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Okay. Dr. Pamade, um, I, I have a question regarding uh, the feedback. Like I know Dr. Temur, he mentioned that it's like, it's very easy to reach out to other residents and to faculty, mm -hmm. but is yeah. there a formal mentorship or, you know, where, uh, the, where the residents get a formal feedback in the program? There is, every uh, resident uh, has to choose a mentor and it's usually a clinical mentor that they, choose uh, based on their uh, personal preference, based on guidance from other residents, based on their future perceived interest, you know, in terms of specialty. And they meet with the mentor as many times as, you know, necessary. Many times it's on probably monthly basis, but it's a minimum of every six months and discuss training, problems, hurdles, future guidance for career. You can have more than one mentor if you can handle meeting with everyone. Um, and some of the reasons that want to pursue research will have a research mentor. So the clinical and research mentor don't have to be the same person. And the research mentor can be changed after six months or a year or uh, any time really based on what, you know, what your needs are. And usually the feedback um, is given to um, candidates at the end of the week. We do one week rotation, um, for example, on a stroke service or general service on Jewish. And we try to give the residents a feedback kind of at the end of the week. If necessary, you can give them the, you know, the guidance right away or something goes wrong or something isn't done right or we need more information or you want them to take a different approach that would benefit them better than what they've done. The, the feedback is given right away. Hi, Dr. Pavadi. 
Yes. Just a quick question. My name is Wally. I'm calling from Arizona, Tucson. Nice weather nice here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, um, are the neurologists, especially residents, are involved in any kind of procedures like LP or different? Yeah, we um, do um, have LPs. Um, sometimes okay. they sign up for Botox, um, uh, EMGs, nerve conduction in adult and pediatrics. Um, we read EGs. Um, occasionally, we have um, residents that wanted to have exposure to evoke potentials. Um, that's kind of a dying procedure, but some of them wanted to be able to at least read some. And we've had residents that paid, um, you know, really enough attention to procedures to where they could go out and be independent. So we had residents that committed to reading a lot of EGs and doing EMGs in the past six months of their last year and became very proficient. Some of them went on to do a fellowship. Some of them went on to just become neurohospitalists and have done really well. But LPs will be... Um, uh, a weekly, uh, sometimes daily occurrence. Sometimes there are five a day that we have to do. So that is not going to be any any issue getting those done. Thank you. To add on that, Dr. Pallade, uh, like uh, those who are interested in the neuro intervention, we can choose the neuro intervention as an elective as well. And uh, uh, you can pretty much uh, shadow initially and then assist during the intervention process, especially if the mechanical come back to me. Uh, that also you can gain an answer, I think. Yeah, and I was just going to add on the fact that uh, the way the program is structured, like the second year is most mostly floor based, where you get the maximum, like you will never complain, I don't have LPs to do. But the best thing is like in the fourth year, you'll have time where you, you can have a three month dedicated mini fellowship. And you can do that mini fellowship in anything you want. Say, say I'm trying to do a mini fellowship in epilepsy and I'm having a goal of reading maybe 500 or 600 EEGs. Or if you want to do a mini fellowship in neuromuscular, all you can do those three months is on the clinic, just do EMGs. So it's a tailor-based thing what you want. In the fourth year, I mean, you that, that's a plus point, which I honestly have not seen other, in other programs while I was interviewing. So uh, you can do whatever you want based on what you really like you want to do. Thank you. I had a question from somebody. Uh, one of them was, how is the program planning to address the uh, expected increase in number of applications they are receiving this year? So we're actually increasing the number of interview dates and interviewees to where we're almost going to double the amount of, um, um, you know, applications we're, we're probably reviewing and the number of the uh, people we're inviting for interviews. So we're trying to... Just like everyone is probably doing more, we're doing doing uh, more as well, and we'll go f with the interviews all the way through beginning of February. So that was one of the questions. Um, somebody else asked, what is it like to live in Louisville? Um, I think it's pretty awesome, I'll, I'll tell you. It's a low cost of living city. Um, some of our residents have been shocked to how expensive it is to go somewhere else and pay rent and pay a parking spot for the car of over $150 when here they had a free bedroom and they had to be crammed up in a one-room bedroom for about three four $400 more. But that's that's what it is. Um, you can find just about any restaurant you can dream of. You probably cannot go out and eat at 2 a.m. like you would in New York, but you can find just about any kind of food. There's plenty of stuff to do around the city, going from parks. We have some on our um, social media, uh, lakes, parks, uh, Randy's gone, wide water rafting. Um, there's this uh, giant forest uh, pictures you'll find over there. Um, there are numerous, numerous places for biking, golfing, riding horses. Um, Cincinnati is just about an hour away from Cincinnati. You can get flights to Europe. It's, you know, one flight away, essentially. You first land from Cincinnati is Paris. So if you have, you know, a few hundred dollars and three days a weekend, you can probably go to Paris for the weekend. There have been um, two flights before pandemic to Reykjavik. Some of the residents and some of the faculty have gone there, and I hear it was beautiful. Um, the Smoky Mountains. Yeah. What would you suggest? What would you suggest other than what I just said? And Dr. If, if I, places, he needs to speak up. If I may add, Dr. Lani. Yeah. 
Yeah. Hey, I'm I'm Yusuf. I'm PGY too. I just came in. Hey, Yusuf. <laughs> Yeah. So it's 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 a. I always say it's a small town with big feel. As I related, um, you will find everything here. As Dr. Plata just said, awesome restaurants. All cuisines are available. And if you are a fan of jogging or like to you know move around, we have a beautiful bridge, a waterfront park. So it's really near. I have Talita with me as well. She's a PGY too. <laughs> so um, we we really enjoy that. It's like a 10 to 15 minutes walk from the hospital. So whenever you have free time, you can see the beautiful sunset. You can walk to Indiana. It's really close. And then the other thing is that everything is very near. We are at the we are at the center. It's a four hour Chicago drive, four hour Michigan drive, four hour Smoky Mountain drive. Then you have direct flights to Vegas, direct flights to New York. So I think we, we live in a very uh, interesting place. And the other thing from an educational point of view, if you're interested in your interventional, as you said, if some guys are, we live in the stroke belt. We live, literally live in the stroke belt. So you'll see a lot of educational cases when it comes to stroke. And then we have a strong pathway towards stroke as well. So we are very excited in the program. We have good leadership. And we would like you guys to come to us as well. <laughs> good pitch. <laughs> um, somebody asked if there is a separate neurohospitalist track. There is not a necessarily a neurohospitalist track, but all the rotation at Jewish hospital, and there'll be enough of them, will really train you to be a very efficient um, neurohospitalist. Um, we have several residents that have gone uh, to become neurohospitalists without fellowship, and we still have some that will be graduating and deciding to do that. You will be fully prepared to handle a neurohospitalist service without any um, any problems. I can guarantee you that. Um, I would just add something on that, like based on my experience, yeah. just to the neuro hospitalist thing, since I'm more interested in that position and I'm looking up like to explore my options. So I was talking to a possible place where I might go and and I discussed the idea that we have neuro hospitalist opportunities where we have a separate rotation. It's a call a neuro hospitalist rotation. And they were like really surprised because very few programs have actually have that. And uh, I discussed the autonomy we have there and how like we make our own decisions and attending is uh, like you are the boss here, you do the job, you are senior enough to run the show now. So I think it's it's pretty unique to what we do here in our third and fourth year running the neuro hospitalist uh, service. It's an incredible learning opportunity, honestly. I will say something else that, you know, um, kind of based off the neuro hospitalist track. We have had a history of um, telemedicine now. Um, we really had intended to uh, develop telemedicine about four or five years ago. Um, and Dr. Shah, who was the previous program director, started the initiative. Um, and within a year, it didn't just bud, but it exploded in its face. So we have now signed up at least 12 hospitals surrounding us that uh, we provide telemedicine um, contracts and coverage. Um, stroke in general. Some of them are done, a lot of the coverage is done by nurse practitioners. And the good part about that is that these are hospitals that are, you know, satellite to us, affiliated from Indiana, from um, Tennessee, some from the remaining of Kentucky. Easy cases are treated over the phone pretty much, the seizures are made, but patients stay locally. Tough cases, interesting cases, things that you want to be involved and learn from come here. And you don't get a volume, but you uh, see the interesting cases. So that's a really good uh, learning opportunity without having to do another 10 admissions and discharges because the cases were too easy. So it's a nice way of triaging cases and really getting the best here. Um, and I think with the pandemic now, we literally switched overnight to telemedicine and we're able to take care of the patients without any issues because of the exposure we've had before. So if you ever come here, I tell our residents, take advantage of the telemedicine rotation because, um, you know, three, four, five years, ten years down the road, so much medicine will be delivered via telemedicine. It's important to know how to do it properly, maximize the reimbursement, and be efficient at it. Yeah. And the other thing is that uh, one of the good things of our program is that general neurology is an uh, admitting service as well. A lot of programs are just console service. So we have admissions in stroke, general neurology, epilepsy, and then as Dr. Plata said, Jewish hospital, it's a complete order of neuro hospitalists. You see strokes and everything else. 
And uh, one other thing, exciting thing, which I found here was that we have a very strong neurosurgery department, which likes to deal with epilepsy patients. They like to do surgeries. So that is another aspect which we see a lot. Uh, that side that what patients are good candidates for who are epileptic and uh, can have surgeries as well. That was pretty exciting for me. So a lot of things, a lot of things to learn from. Yeah, adding up to that, like, um, so is it comprehensive stroke center and also a tertiary care center? So you will get a, most of the referred and complicated patients, <laughs> patients, and that holds true for the clinic exposure as well. So I don't think you will uh, be unprepared um, um, during this four year, like you will see all the kind of diverse cases, you get very good exposure, and that's what is needed for uh, practice independently. Yeah. And when we, when we like, I'm from Pakistan originally, um, Nepal, we have diverse group. We, we, have, we are very IMG friendly. It's a, it's a very nice group, as I said, and a very good leadership. So we feel home, literally, because we like to share a lot of things and then when you, when we come from that uh, from a third world country or second world country, and then we have these technological advances, so we are literally blessed to learn from a lot of other things. Which, if you want to go back, if you want to stay here, you can always mix the best of the both worlds. I'm pretty sure you you guys are doing a great job over there where you come from or you're here. So there's a lot of good stuff which you can learn, and we would like you to bring your good stuff here as well, and then make get a good mixture out of it. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, hello, Mr. Uh, Dr. Tareen, Dr. Yusuf, Dr. Bhagat, and Dr. Kalade. Uh, thank you for doing this. Um, my question is, uh, could you comment upon how uh, the relationship is with psychiatry and neurosurgery and uh, what kind of multidisciplinary effort uh, happens in neuroscience at your will? Mm. I can comment on that. Um, the um... Grand rounds are multidisciplinary. Um, psychiatry, PMNR, neurosurgery are all participating in the neuroscience. We actually take turns into neurosciences, so it's a very close interaction. Our uh, clinics will be moving in a building where PMNR and neurosurgery are, so we'll be separating literally by a ceiling um, in the next, probably in the next six months or so. Um, neurosurgery re uh, residents rotate in neurology, and at their request, the neurology residents can rotate into um, neurosurgery. Um, there is a neurointerventional, uh, well, a neurocritical care um, from neurosurgery faculty that rounds on our patients. So there is constant, constant and um, continuous interaction between neurosurgery, neuroanesthesia, who provides the ICU care, um, and neurology. So. Um, it happens multiple times a day. You can't avoid it. It's it's there to stay. Psychiatry residents rotate in um, neurology for several months, and they have, I believe, eight a year. So our service is constantly inundated with psychiatry residents. So we split them between services, but they're all the time. And our residents rotate in psychiatry in their PGY3, which is mandatory for the boards. Um, we get counsels from psychiatry, so it's a close. You can't separate the two of them. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so every field which has to do something with brain, we are part of them. They are part of us. That's how I put that. And we get a good exposure. We we try to we have rotations with them. They have rotations with us. We go with them. With neurosurgery, we have a very good relation because when they're stroke patients, we like them to be on cranny watch, or they have some patients which have stroke they want. So we are we are part of them. They are part of us. Thank you. There was another question on the chat. If we have scholarly uh, tracks available, clinician scientist tracks or physician educator tracks, I I would have to assume that that's for um, faculty, correct? Trying to see who asked the question. Maria? Maria Abraham. Um, um, residents have the same uniform um, schedule. There is not one resident that chooses a track versus another. So everything is split equal, equally. PGY2 tends to look the same, PGY3 tends to look the same, PGY4 tends to look the same throughout the years, unless we have an increase in complement or we have more pediatric neurology coming in. But for the most part, the years look the same. The only major change was whenever we switched from regular call to the night float. 
Um, the physicians do have the choice to be um, um, one of the physician educator or um, clinician scientists where they have a research component, but that's you know really up to the chair, up to their um, qualifications, and it's very individual. Um, so I think they're probably about half 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 clinical educators and half uh, clinician scientists, if, if that answers the question. Um, there was another question about stroke fellowship in our hospital. Um, we do have a stroke fellowship. The funds in the years when we don't have a, an applicant or don't have a fellow are diverted for um, other purposes. We've had some of our residents that um, have applied and Dr. Dr. Habubi completed a stroke fellowship, and before him, Dr. Ender completed a stroke fellowship here. Um, I'm sure there'll be more interest in the future again. Um, let me see, anything else that I missed here? Hey there, I'm uh, Nathan Baisden. I'd like to ask a question, that's okay? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, so can you, you, I think you touched on it earlier, but can you speak a little bit about the prelim year, like what we'll be doing next year? I think you mentioned something about four months and that you're like hoping to increase it even more after that. Like, could you speak a little bit more about that? So the requirement for boards is one full year of internal medicine to be completed in the PGY-1. As, as part of those 12 months, eight of them are mandatory to be medicine. The other four are elective. What we've done in the past, based on the residents' um, request and suggestion, was that we would bring the PGY-1s into neurology and allow them to rotate on services, that being stroke or general or Jewish, and one of the, the fourth month was neuroradiology. Um, at the last week, they even suggested maybe they can do a body call where they can join one of the PGY-3s or PGY-4s during their PGY-1 for a whole night of um, night float, just so they can see what, or, or the whole week of night float, to see what the night float system is like, how to put on the orders, where you go to emergency room, just to get used to the um, program a little bit before they actually start PGY-2. And most of the rotations tend to be toward the end of the PGY-1, so they'll be here in April or May or June, so they'll be kind of eased in into neurology instead of just having a complete year of medicine and then they come in neurology where everything is new. They asked um, last week if one of those months instead of neuroradiology perhaps could be an elective and if doing psychiatry in the PGY-1 is an option, that way they can have more elective time. So we're currently looking into that. But four months could be elective and a lot of them have chosen to come to neurology, get used to the words and the services and ease the transition into PGY-2. Okay, thank you. Sure. Does anyone have any other questions? I'm going to try to pull um, something here from my mail, see if we have anything else that we haven't discussed. Dr. Pilati, are there any opportunities for um, clinical research? We do have uh, clinical research opportunities. Um, Dr. Um, Friedland is our uh, behavioral specialist. He's big in gut microbiota and uh, implications for memory impairment and neurological disorders. He's actually going to December um, full year on um, sabbatical in Japan. He's the one that ran the dementia, the recent dementia symposium that was in Abu Dhabi. Of course, it was virtual, but he's the one that organizes and he's one of the main speakers um, for the many past few years. Um, a lot of faculty do have other components of clinical research that they do in neuroimmunology, um, demyelinating disorders, there are clinical trials being involved. There's always a stroke trial uh, occurring. Um, there are occasionally clinical trials for epilepsy. So there's always something going on. But in terms of there is headache, there is headache research. Dr. Barnes, who is the um, director of the Autism Center on Pediatrics, is actually running a seminar on um, research for residents. We're hoping that a year or two or three down the road, we will require the residents to have a published research, uh, not just presentation at the national meeting, but something published, and we're going to try to make it mandatory, but it has to be, we have to have the structure for that to occur. So far, what, the, what we're doing, we're allowing the residents to present posters at the uh, um, 
the Commonwealth of Kentucky Neurological Society, which usually happens in May, it's a two-day event, and the residents can present poster and um, their publications during the meeting the first day. And there are, there are conferences occurring throughout the year. It's usually the stroke that happens in June or July. There is an epilepsy and headache that happens either in the fall or the spring um, where the residents can present. And a lot of them have little clinical projects. And actually, the, our residents' list of scholarly activity is really impressive. There are many, many, many pages of publications, involvement, so, yeah. Yeah, to add up on that, um, uh, basically the research, like uh, if you are focused about certain field like that of uh, epilepsy or stroke, or um, uh, you can choose your mentor as we talked before and start working on your own ideas or start joining the ideas of the um, uh, attending and then you can pretty much start right from the beginning. And they're very approachable. You can make your own database and you can work on it. Uh, currently, there are three trials going on the research uh, stroke, uh, cardia, most trial, and crest trial, and you can be uh, sub-PI on that and get an exposure how to be enroll the patients in the trials. Uh, that's the thing. And Dr. Pallade also mentioned about Dr. Barnes, uh, and uh, we are in the team are working to expand the research uh, horizon over here, and pretty much in coming years, we'll have our independent research symposium and then and so, so on and so forth. Um, just like last year in the AAN from the child neurology and adult neurology, we have 15 abstracts that were accepted over there uh, along with the oral presentation as well. And uh, this happens kind of every year. Um, um, so this time also we'll see how, how many of them will get accepted. And we present our uh, work in uh, all the international conferences, ANA, uh, a and ISC headache symphonium, uh, and uh, that helps in our CV as well. So on average, three um, of the four uh, graduating residents choose to go into a fellowship. A few of them have settled really into neurohospital's position even after completing a fellowship. Uh, but last year we had three of them that went into stroke different universities, um, Boston, um, WashU, Emory. Um, there's somebody else that joined NIH for a neuroimmunology fellowship. The prior was similar to that. Almost every year that I know, uh, residents have gone free to the fellowship and one of them in a hospitalist. Um, and like I said, even some of the ones that have gone into a fellowship have settled for neurohospitalist positions because I think there's a, you know, there is a financial incentive to that. There is a time incentive to that. And a lot of them that have family and want to spend more time with them, will choose that at least initially as the first um, stage of the career. Anybody else has any other questions? I think somebody wanted to know about didactics. Um, do you want me to go into that and explain or? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, regarding the didactics, uh, um, it's uh, three hours dedicated didactics timed uh, during a Friday. One hour uh, will be dedicated to the child neurology and two hour in the adult neurology. Uh, and we pretty much save a syllabus uh, every year. Uh, it's uh, usually um, a kind of a, um, a system-based kind of syllabus. Uh, this time we're running a kind of uh, epilepsy for a month, stroke for a month, uh, uh, movement disorder for a month, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, and uh, the didactics are of a very high yield. Uh, the PowerPoints will be shared as well. Uh, and it's a very crucial part of our learning. And um, same thing will go um, on the child neurology part as well. Uh, so these are the three hours of dedicated didactics we have. Uh, apart from that, um, we do have case conference, journal club, and m, &M conferences. Uh, and that's every week we do one, and there'll be one journal club uh, um, every month. And um, apart from that, uh, we have separated uh, our resident to resident teaching. Uh, during that teaching, uh, it gives a, we generally uh, teach about the neuroanatomy and then uh, the things that are very high yield uh, for the board exams um, and the right exams. Um, so it has been well spread. Uh, the all, entire didactics, and also we have additional one uh, lecture about uh, 
neuroradiology conference every month where we discuss all the complicated and interesting cases in person with a neuroradiologist, Dr. Downs or Dr. Birds, um, and get a better understanding of that as well. And we're setting up the syllabus for the neuroradiology conference as well. I think uh, Dr. Downs wants to go with the anatomy first, and after that he also wants to go spine and then vasculature and then brain. So we keep on modulating on that, uh, but uh, the didactics are very high yield and very interactive. Does anybody else wants to ask any other questions? Um, there's a question about how do residents prepare for the neurology boards. So every, um, Dr. Bagat just mentioned, every Thursday there is a um, resident-led case conference. A lot of cases uh, are discussed and a lot of lectures um, in terms of anatomy, uh, neurophysiology are discussed similar to the board uh, questions. Toward the end of the year, usually end of December, beginning of January, they start going through some of the uh, prior years in service exam and they um, go in a round table and discuss those. The, um, some of the lectures that we do on Fridays will have a short session of, um, last year we did before and after um, questions. So we're testing uh, residents' ability to recall information that was presented randomly throughout the year. And then after an organized session of usually about a month in a certain subspecialty, it could be movement disorder or epilepsy or stroke, we presented um, similar questions, not identical, but similar questions uh, to try to see if, the, if there was an improvement in you know, retention, really, of the information presented. And uh, I think we've seen really phenomenal um, results on uh, in service exam this year. It could be because they read more, but I think there's a potential that organizing um, the lectures with before and after questions and just kind of summing up the information has really helped them retain more. So the numbers on correct percentages of uh, questions answered on in service exam has uh, really gone high up at all levels, PGY 2s, 3s, and 4s. So I think something was done right. I would just um, add so, something. Uh, sorry, I don't know who was talking. It was Dominique, just me. Um, I'll and add the, that the program purchases. Uh, that's exactly board. what I was going to say. Oh. Yeah, go um, ahead. This, go ahead. This, the senior year, um, the program purchases the board of vitals or some board prep material to share with all the graduates before their September boards as well. And it's we made the decision every year based on what they've told us they want. So it's up to the seniors what they want to purchase. Um, Just to add a couple of lines on didactics. That's that. This is what I personally feel as a resident. I mean, a uh, couple of words. I mean, no matter how organized the didactics and everything are, I think it just comes down to the resident and the eagerness to learn. And one thing I really am glad about the fact. I mean, Bhagat would agree to it. I mean. The resident to resident teaching uh, from honestly, our seniors taught us really well. I mean, I can recall and Bhagat would agree. Uh, I can recall names. Uh, they were phenomenal in, in teaching me some basics in my second year, my third year. And I was so, I was so like confident to call them at any time with any images or anything. And they would say, hey, this looks like this. Um, any anything, epilepsy, stroke, that's where the real learning, I think, comes from, from patients. The books can teach you a thousand things. You can go through a hundred PowerPoints, but when you really see that patient and you get stuck in that position, that's when you really learn. Just like this morning, um, I mean, me and Bhagat were checking out and we discussed one MRI. We just exchanged our thoughts. And I mean, those those things really stick with you. And that's something we are really big on. I mean, some things which some residents will say to you at some stage, they will stick with you. Uh, I always quote my senior resident when I was in first year, taught me how to interpret uh, stroke scans. I, he, he taught me a mnemonic, DATG, and I always teach it to my juniors. I mean, I said, the credit for this goes to Dr. Das. So this is the teaching that we, this is the, I mean, this is the value that we are really proud of. Uh, we get this from our seniors, we, we pass it on to our juniors and with the, with, with the belief that you'll pass it on to your juniors one day. 
And Dr. if Bagar I'm is passing, Dr. Bagar is passing on the neurology survival book, which make will make everybody's life easier as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> and one more thing I want to add as a PGY too. So when you'll come to residency, I know you all will have this unknown fear that what if we are alone in a pressure situation? I mean, it's, but the best thing about our program is that our faculty is extremely accessible, extremely accessible. We don't have a time clock. We don't share any 24 hour. I can call to Dr. Pilar at 3 a.m. in the morning and trust me, she'll be giving me the best advice at that time. And I've done that. So any stroke attending or any general attending, they're always accessible. You will have some situations where you will want help and that's the right thing to do and you will get help. So that's something I'm proud of. <laughs> Um, I think I answered most of the questions. There was somebody that asked um, about support provided to residents during transition from intern year to junior year, and I think I've touched on that. So I don't think I, there's anything that I could answer. I think everything that's been in the chat and I have answered. Anybody else has any any other questions that I'd like to know before we end? Uh, Dr. Plata, one thing which I also said in the previous virtual is that the people who are coming from outside states, make sure you know which pathway you are taking. I know, so ECFMG has given pathway one, pathway two, pathway three. So make sure your documentation towards that is complete. Uh, I know a lot of people have been asking me that which pathway we should we take, whichever certifies you or whichever completes your documents, that's the right pathway. There's no right or wrong in that. Dominique, is it anything else we needed to discuss that came across to you? Dr. Khalid, um, yeah. hello, hi. My name, is, my name is Farid Khan. Sorry, my voice is not clear. Um, currently, I'm suffering from COVID-19. I'm one of the residents here in Pakistan. Uh, so uh, uh, my question is, uh, sometimes we come across like a very difficult case in the year, especially on the stroke code, and uh, you want to do MRI quickly and to rule out like whether this is like a stroke or not before giving TPA. Because in Pakistan, like uh, TPA is like being paid by patient, uh, not from the insurance or uh, on the panel. So how uh, quickly MRI is available in your ER? Yeah, I can answer that question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so our uh, stroke screening is based upon the CT, CTP, and CTA imaging. But there are certain kind of the instances, I think you were talking about the wake-up trial. Uh, we're not sure about exactly the time limit. And we generally get the MRI and check between the DWI and T2 uh, mismatch and then decide about the TPA. And we have done that a um, um, couple of times. I've done that two times uh, during my residency. So this is an ongoing trial that has been going on, wake up trial. And um, um, uh, but we do actively participate on it, but uh, we don't have a dedicated MRI in the ED. Uh, and very few hospital uh, or university has that facility. And uh, um, and believe me, it's a very new trend and it's not that efficient because it is very time consuming to prep up the patient for the MRI in the ED itself. So this is something ongoing trial. Uh, but uh, there are uh, there are some occasions that we use MRI to decide about the TPA. We're flexible on that. Okay. Um, and, um, and one thing I would like yeah, to add, the other thing is the thing is that for the MRI screening, as you know, to make sure there's no metal in the body, uh, we have it's time consuming, as Dr. Bhagat said. But we do use MRAs if a person is uh, allergic to contrast. Like yesterday, I had to use MRAs to get a good scenario. But for TPAs, it's kind of tough. And uh, what were the protocol of, uh, like physical examination is very important uh, in neurology. And during the COVID, uh, what were the protocols of physical examination? Did 
do you guys like limit the physical examination? Like a lot of our uh, residents who are suffering from COVID-19 here, uh, instead of like uh, giving all the PPEs, still uh, there were a lot of residents who were exposed to COVID. So, so over here, I think, uh, yeah. I'm happy to answer that question. Over here, the unit was been separated, um, um, especially the floors were been separated uh, for the COVID patient, uh, both in our university hospital, also in the Jewish hospital. Uh, usually, the ED uh, people and the internal medicine people were uh, first hand exposure of those kind of the patients. Uh, and there is a dedicated team uh, who deals with the COVID patients and they get all the uh, uh, preparation and protections. But there are some kind of the occasions like the acute stroke case or very neurological emergency where we have to go in the ED itself. But we do have a basic level of protection with uh, us. And uh, I don't think any of us um, has encountered any um, uh, COVID so far, uh, despite of the minimal exposure we have. Yeah. yeah. How much is your uh, neurology department uh, integrated with the radiology and neurosurgery like we here have like a uh, lot of classes uh, uh, we, are, we are both resident from radiology and from neurosurgery we are discussing cases and uh, uh, we have common classes uh, like scans and other so i would answer that question i mean it's a day to day thing it's a case to case basic thing uh, if if a neurology resident is on call and if there's a case we just a phone call away. There is always a neurology resident. There is always a neurosurgery resident. There is always a neurosurgery chief. Uh, same goes for radiology. I mean, if uh, just to get back to the fact what Bhagat said, like if if there's a new PGY2, if there's a cord stroke, the patient is in TPA window, and if someone is uncomfortable, so we see the scans in ER. Senior radiology residents are sitting there. We can just sort of go into the room and say, hey, I'm going for. TPA just rule out a bleed for me, and this is just like a double check because you want to make sure um, they have better screens than us, uh, they have better more experience, and then that's that's where the decision is made. I don't think there's a bridge between anything, and this is what is what I'm talking about is day to day dealing. Uh, didactics is definitely there. We always meet, we always talk, discuss cases. I don't know if you were there for the previous part, but we have radiology case conferences, we have combined grand rounds. It's never a problem. I mean, uh, the TPA decision per se is taken by the neurology resident itself. And I don't think guidelines have talked about MRI being the uh, standard guideline for it, but it's never it's never a bridge. I mean, we are always in house. They're just a phone call away. Um, there have been nights when we've talked several times. Yeah, and every time there's a finding, there's a finding on the MRI CAT scans, radiology directly calls us. Every time. Great. All right, for everyone. It was green being great um, meeting you. Um, we'll probably end here. Dr. Yusuf has to go back to seeing patients, right? <laughs> uh, he's on call. And thank you, uh, Tamur, for coming. <laughs> thank you, Rawaj, for coming. Thank you, Dominic, for coming. You're always there. And thank you, everyone, for you know, deciding to spend an hour with us, and hopefully you got most of the questions, if not all, answered. So, thank you. I thank hope you. we get to see each other again, and thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.